We've got some great commentary from two pro crypto advocates in DC that we want to take a look at today. Rep Tom Emmer had an interview with Coindesk. He's called out Gary Gensler and said a new day is coming. Let's hear what he has to say in his most recent interview. And SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce spoke at Duke in regards to digital assets and the evolution of regulation and what steps really need to be taken here in the future to provide clarity for crypto markets. We'll look at some of her comments and try and summarize some of the thoughts that she has. But if we haven't met before, my name's Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. All right, let's look into the Coindesk piece here. What was Gary Gensler really doing, Tom Emmer asked. So we'll dive in here midway to the article. Uh, Tom Emmer, who we know to be the new House Majority Whip, definitely understands crypto and has emerged as one of the space's most powerful advocates. The Blockchain Association's Kristen Smith referred to him as a steadfast crypto champion. He held the first cryptocurrency town hall, introduced a buy Bipartisan Securities Clarity Act to provide a path to regulatory certainty for digital assets. He's co-chair of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus and the Minnesota reformer dubbed him the crypto king of Congress. So why is he bullish on crypto? This is really interesting. He says it's not about crypto clarifying that it's about what crypto is facilitating, the movement towards Web3 or what he prefers to call the ownership economy. That goes to everything I believe in, he says, which is restoring the individual's right to make his or her decisions about what they want to do in the marketplace or who they want to do it with or how they want it to get that done, and they don't have to have a middleman. Ultimately, it's about restoring liberty and choice to individuals. These words are awfully abstract, so Amr gives a quick hypothetical example. It's worth printing in full. You've got some aspiring entertainer who right now puts her content on the YouTube platform. And guess what? She derives no income from that whatsoever. No value unless she sells ads directly to that website. In the new world that we're going to, she can put her content out there as a non-fungible token or NFT that others will pay something to experience or use and that will go directly to her. Maybe it's pennies, but you might have the next Aretha Franklin, who all of a sudden has a seven-figure number of views at a penny or two each, and you see where this goes. I think that's pretty exciting, he says. I think that's fair, and you don't need intermediaries for all these things. For those who follow the space closely, Emmer's example is not particularly groundbreaking. It's standard stuff. This is a now familiar directly empowered creator's argument that Web3 enthusiasts have long championed, but in a way that's exactly the point, and it's astonishing. Ember's not some hoodie-wearing founder on a crypto panel. He's the majority whip and one of the most influential power brokers in the U.S., and he speaks crypto. For this, we can partially blame Coindesk Chief Content Officer Michael Casey. When Ember first joined Congress in 2015, a staffer gave him the book, The Age of Cryptocurrency, co-written by him. And Emmer devoured the book and asked for more. He says that even though he's a 61-year-old fart who likes to read books the old-fashioned way, he has seven kids, so he's always watching the new stuff that they're dealing with. There's a few things, though, that are particularly interesting about Emmer that I think are key for us to really understand. He says, I think you're going to see a lot of bipartisan work to get to the bottom of why the SEC wasn't doing its job. That's in reference to the FTX meltdown. What was Gary Gensler and company really doing? He describes Gensler as, get this, very arrogant and speaking from the mountaintop. And then we find out they're working with a fraudster that built the people out of billions of dollars. Republicans and Democrats are going to be involved with that. He certainly has taken uh, Gensler to task in the past and has shown no fear at doing so in the future. Now, he's got a few additional comments here in this piece. I'll run through quickly. Uh, he's talking about Sam Bankman-Fried. He's talking about some of the other people in D.C. 
he says that consumers need protection. The FTX is less of an outlier and more of a systemic failure. As the Senate's chief crypto critic, Elizabeth Warren, tweeted, the collapse of one of the largest crypto platforms shows how much of the industry appears to be smoke and mirrors. But he responds to this and says, the senator from Massachusetts, who will go unnamed, is arguing that the problem is crypto itself. But no, SBF and his colleagues are as old as finance. This is about centralization. They controlled everything. The roots of the problem, he says, is that Sam Bakeman fried was incentivized to set up shop in the Bahamas, which let FTX's executives hide their shenanigans. For this, he partly blames Senator Warren. FTX manipulated this thing from offshore because of people like the senator from Massachusetts who will not get anything of substance done so that we can have this investment, this innovation right here in this country. It's a crypto legal framework that got to be in the Caribbean, for goodness sake, when stuff should have been here all along. That's really key. Having unclear or non-existent guidelines drives innovation overseas, and that too opens up the door for fraud because you don't have legitimate consumer protections, not the fictitious ones that Gary Gensler proclaims, but real consumer protections that are going to keep investors safe. If people like Gary Gensler would do his damn job, he says, we might not have some of these issues. So certainly willing to take Gensler to task. I'll be curious to see the line of questioning Gensler has to face at his next appearance before the House, and we will certainly discuss that when that time comes, but do expect it to not be a pleasant experience for him. Now, Hester Peirce gave these remarks, and I wanted to run through it real quickly. This was at the Duke Conference about digital assets. This is a lengthy speech. You can see here, I'm just going to scroll top to bottom. It's very lengthy. It's uh, annotated. You can see all the references. There's uh, about five dozen references here in this piece, so there are certainly other places you can turn to for uh, additional information related to her speech. But what I want to key in here on are uh, five things that she says are sort of the most important lessons that she wanted to be the takeaway from her speech. She says the first and most important lesson for people who believe in crypto's future is they should not wait for regulators to fix the problems that bubbled to the surface in 2022. They can act themselves to root out harmful policies or harmful practices and encourage good behavior. Regulatory solutions, which tend to be inflexible, should be a last resort, not a first resort. People working together voluntarily are much better at fixing things than regulators using their inherently coercive power to impose mandatory solutions. Second, remember the point of crypto. It's not driving up crypto prices so you can dump tokens on someone else. Digital assets need to trade so centralized venues or decentralized exchange protocols are necessary, but trading markets are not the ultimate point, nor is the point of crypto to lend your assets so that other people can trade them, although lending markets in which everyone is aware of the risks are not inherently problematic. Rather, at its core, crypto is about solving a trust problem. How can you interact and transact safely with people you do not know? Traditionally, people have looked to centralized intermediaries or government to solve this problem, but technology like cryptography, blockchain, and zero-knowledge proofs offer new solutions. Third, each crypto asset, blockchain, and project needs to be assessed for its own merits. Talking about crypto as if it's a monolith obscures important differences and makes it easier for scammers to hide in the crowd. Fourth, problems in the design of a protocol or a centralized infrastructure provider can have sweeping disastrous consequences. Testing protocols and careful analysis of the incentives you are building into infrastructure can prevent problems from arising after the protocol or infrastructure has been widely adopted. And fifth, she says, although crypto enables reduced reliance on centralized intermediaries, as long as companies are actively involved in crypto, people should take the same precautions as they would when dealing with any other company. Unthinking trust in centralized intermediaries is antithetical to crypto. As you assess a company's products and services, consider the associated risks. 
Six, in addition to the importance of recognizing and protecting against counterparty risk, many other lessons from traditional finance are equally applicable to crypto. And I, I think I said five at the beginning, but really there is this sixth one. And here, as you go through, these are important core lessons. Risk matter. Higher return usually means higher risk. Recognize that and plan accordingly. Counterparties matter. Choose your exposure to them wisely. Your counterparties. Counterparties matter. There's no such thing as pure bilateral risk. Look at what we've seen in some of these crypto uh, cases where Three Arrows Capital was a counterparty to your counterparty, but then that risk got passed back to you. So again, and maybe it wasn't totally clear, but that's just an example. Or Luna and all these funds that were invested in those projects associated there. So you look at some of the ones associated uh, with big time investments or big time uh, hedge funds, and you look at Andreessen Horowitz or all these other parties that were investing, but you don't know where those investments finally trickled down to. Uh, leverage matters. Leverage magnifies losses in the same way it can possibly uh, leverage gains, Collateral matters. If you make an unsecured loan, you're going to be at the back of the line. In a bankruptcy, a secured loan affords you more protection. If the collateral's good, that is. Conflicts of interest matter. We have certainly have seen that, not just with crypto cases here, but look at what happens when you have representatives of the people in agencies like the SEC with conflicts of interest. What does that do? What does that mean for investors? Motives for buying matter. FOMO? is an inadequate reason to buy an asset, including a crypto asset. Risk controls matter. Concentration matters. There's so many key lessons in traditional finance that are applicable in crypto as well. And of course, vice versa. Some of the lessons that we've learned through crypto can be applied to traditional financial markets as well. So some good comments here from her. I'll link this down below if you want to see more detail of what she had to say. She did have a few other uh, comments that I think were worth reading and talking about the Howey test and some of the applications and if those are uh, appropriate or not. So do check it out if you have the opportunity. I hope you found the information here to be helpful. If you did, drop a like. It helps the channel a ton and helps me keep you informed. Hit that subscribe button so I can keep you up to date on all the latest news. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. I do truly appreciate it. Have a fantastic rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one.